Hey, this is Adam, as always, and this is Real Home Recording. Joining me in this video is Michael Jolly of Octava Mod. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Hey, Adam, nice to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm actually using one of your microphones, your modified microphones right now. I've been using one for the longest time on a lot of the on-camera videos. So that's, that's, that's great to hear. And, you know, it's a real coincidence because I'm using a modified, one of my modified microphones too. I'm using a, a modified uh, MXL uh, 990 USB mic. So it's it, even for a plug and play mic, um, this thing is, is wonderful. It's, it's not only does it do uh, uh, podcasts, but um, I've, I've got some folks uh, who are just, you know, focused on being singer songwriters and don't want to have a lot of gear. And, uh, you know, they said, can I just get a microphone to plug into my computer? And this, uh, this MXL, uh, USB mic is, is, uh, is sweet. It's got a large diaphragm capsule in it. So, um, it was, it was an easy matter for me to change the head basket, change the capsule, do a little bit of uh, electronics on it. And it's, uh, you get like a, a studio quality mic in a, in a USB package. Good times. Yeah, I'm using a uh, MXL 603S and the Ultimate Mod I got. I don't know if you still offer those or not. You, you know, I just took it off. It was on the shop until last week, and we got so busy with uh, with a new product that I think you want to want to. We're going to talk about um, the K47H. Uh, we got so busy with that that I had to take a few products off the catalog so we could uh, focus the, the staff and myself on on uh, finishing up work and shipping uh, the new stuff. Um, so, so temporarily, yeah, the aftermarket mods or, and the new um, uh, uh, ultimate mod for the, uh, for the 603 pencil mic uh, doesn't exist. Okay, but one day they may return. <clears throat> I think what's going to happen is um, I, I've got a pencil mic in the works, which is going to be my own branded MJE, uh, Michael Jolly Engineering uh, pencil mic. Uh, that is going to be a step beyond the modified MXL class of mic. So I, I may not even bring back um, that the, the the 603 type mod uh, and go right to just um, bringing out my own my own branded pencil mic. Awesome, awesome. So let's actually talk about uh, the MJE 47 or the, the new one that you just came out with. The, that mm -hmm. go ahead, uh, just tell me about it. Yeah, it's uh, MJE. Uh, for Michael Jolly Engineering, it's a, a, a we call it a K forty seven H. It's a it's a it rolls right uh, off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you say it about a hundred times a day, it, it, it gets stuck there and, and then does roll quite easily. Um, forty seven, uh, the K. So the history of that model number, um, you know, the Neumann U forty seven was the first microphone that. Uh, use that K47 capsule. So this new product that I have, it's a, it's a large diaphragm microphone, um, and it uses a K47 type capsule. That's a, a, a type of a capsule design that's now in the public domain. So I, I've made some changes to that, and um, but I keep the uh, I keep the nomenclature, the K47 because it refers to a type of capsule, and that gives people um, a historic reference point for what that mic might sound like. So I'm, I'm referencing a Neumann K47 capsule. I call it a K47H because it's a capsule head. And what that means is it's, um, it screws onto a pencil body. It actually screws onto the Octava MK012 small diaphragm pencil body. So it's, it's a systems microphone. The, the K47H is the, is the head basket portion of the microphone with a connector on it, and it screws on very securely onto the small diaphragm 012. It reminds me of a lollipop. <laughs> uh, it does, yeah. And, and, uh, and for folks who know Gefell microphones, it reminds a lot of folks of, uh, of a Gefell UM70. Which is uh, it's a very it's a very handsome mic. It's a very small a very small uh, capsule head, uh, and that uh, imparts um, some of the unique uh, sonic signature that that mic has. The the, the capsule head uh, dimensions and shape. All right. Well, tell me about some of the uses usages for your new mic. 
Well, I think of it primarily as a vocal mic, um, uh, an acoustic guitar mic, and if you want a really old school uh, drum overhead sound, uh, these are wonderful as either um, a Coincident XY or a Spaced XY or even uh, a Glyn Johns uh, type of uh, drum miking technique. It's, it's got a, um, it's, it's a mid-focus mic. It's, it, the, the proximity effect is dialed back a little bit from what you would experience in a Neumann microphone. A lot of times uh, a U47, uh, a U87, those mics have very, very big uh, proximity effect and it's almost too powerful and you have to, um, you have to high pass filter that to get a, a, a usable uh, vocal sound. So my K47 was designed to have a little bit less proximity effect so it, it can be used close up uh, on vocals uh, and you don't have to resort to high pass filtering and whenever you put a high pass filter in, you're going to get some phase shift. So by not having to use a high pass filter, downstream in your chain. Uh, it lowers the phase shift and it makes for vocals uh, with a lot more impact. So it's, um, it's a mid-focused, very usable proximity effect. And, and what's really notable about it is the top end is absolutely sibilance free. And it's uh, a softer top end than, a U, than say a, a U87, which is kind of known for its upper mid push. So it's, it's, it's surprisingly enough, this new K47H sounds a lot like the classic Neumann U67, which is, which was Neumann's follow up to the U47. They brought out in the sixties as a close field vocal microphone. Um, and it's, it's a highly revered tube microphone with a, with a mid focus and a soft top. So this K47 uh, is, is, um, is was sort of an accidental emulation of the sound of the, of the U67. Without a tube, though. Without a tube, yeah. And now that's one of the things that you're going to hear. I've got some samples up at my, on a blog page on my site. Um, you can, uh, comparing the, the K47H with the U67, uh, on first listen, the, the overall timbre balance of the two mics is quite similar. But if you start to, if you switch your hearing into like focusing on dynamics, that you can hear that the U67 has a bit of, of compression going on. That's a combination of the tube and the, the tube, the transformer and the negative feedback circuit. So uh, the, the U67 sounds a bit more processed, maybe a bit more radio ready right out of the mic and, and the K67, uh, K, uh, and, and my mic, the, the K47H, um, doesn't have, it's a FET and transformerless mic, so it doesn't have that dynamics compression that you get with a tube transformer circuit. Yeah, um, the U67, I've seen that used, um, I'm a drummer, and I've seen that used as a room mic a lot you know, even in modern productions, would you say that's kind of a recommended thing as well? Yeah, this would make a really nice room mic. Um, it's, it's got a fairly wide cardioid pattern and the off axis response is very smooth. Um, so, it, you know, if you're, if you're backing off from the source and you're going to get a high degree of room sound relative to the source, it's going to be a very natural, uh, capture of the room sound yeah but that's typically what i'm going for i don't you know i, I mean I, I don't have a great room to, to record in but i do want something that you know does sound like the room and then i can eq it out if i you know which i usually do but mm -hmm. um actually the, the mic that you know that i'm using right now that's something that i really like about your mics is like you said it's got a nice like open top end but without it sounding sibilant um <laughs> That's a real, a real characteristic of what I do is, uh, is it, and there's a couple of reasons for it. This, and a very open quality. I, I'm amazed. I'm, you know, I'm listening to you on Skype right now and, you know, Skype and, and, uh, with the compression can step on S's <laughs> and really, and really make them get kind of smeared sounding. So, uh, I, I'm really kind of amazed that, that your voice sounds as good in my headphones right now, you know, 
over Skype and, and you're, you, and you're coming from a small diaphragm mic. And I know that mic really well. And, uh, yeah, the top end is, is smooth and it's not sibilant. Um, yeah, so that's that, that open quality, um, comes from, uh, my use of a single layer head basket design through all of the work that I do, whether it's a small diaphragm, a large diaphragm or a ribbon mic, everything I do uses a single layer head basket. And um, actually that brings me to a good question. Just so people don't think, you know, you're, you're some like newbie. Tell me some of the companies that you've done work for over the years and how long have you been at this engineering game? Uh, uh, I, I, I started, I started, uh, I, st I had a profound experience when I was three, uh, and I started, um, with a radio. Um, uh, I, I remember, uh, we lived in an apartment when I was three and I remember reaching up, I was, you know, the, reaching up to, to, to touch and tune a table radio, a tube type <laughs> old fashioned table radio. Uh, you know, so when you're three, you're not too tall. So I, I, I distinctly remember having to reach up over my head to reach up to where this, maybe it was up on the shelf by a, a counter, maybe a countertop. That's what it was. <laughs> so it would have been a countertop to reach up. So I, I remember reaching up, grabbing the knob, the tuning knob, and just flicking it back and forth because I loved that sound of, it was AM radio, you know, so you could hear that. <laughs> what, was it, was it a cathedral radio? No, I wasn't that old. It, it was it was merely uh, you know probably more like uh, an uh, Philips uh, or something. Uh, just a table radio, but not like, not like a cathedral type. But the point, you know. But then my mom said, "Hey, Michael, don't do that. You're going to break the radio." And I thought in my mind, and this is kind of like the genesis of knowing, you know, that there's like power and there's a pl and there's something that you know you could do something with this stuff. And I realized, well. No, I'm not going to break the radio. I didn't tell her this, but it's, it, you know, in retrospect, I mean, but I remember having this thought that no, I'm not going to break the radio because they put the tuning dial on the radio so that you could tune it. Now, what she objected to was the fact that I was just like yanking it back and forth, and you know, <laughs> not listening to any one station in particular, but just enjoying the the way that things would bump up against each other. Yeah, so, and you literally had like a lot of people who have never, you know, used an analog radio, you have to like tune it and listen as you're tuning. Otherwise it won't come in loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah. You got to find the center of the, uh, of the, of the band of the frequency band. Um, so that was, that was a very early experience with, with, uh, sound technology and electronics. And, um, but, but, you know, most specifically to mod microphones and microphone modification, um, in the, all through the 80s and early 90s, I worked for uh, David Blackmer, who is the, the founder of um, uh, DBX, co-founder of DBX, the DB of DBX, and, <laughs> and, um, and, his, and his business partner. And David also you know, went on to found uh, Earthworks microphones. So in the early 90s, the only, you know, it, the, the large, diaphragm, large diaphragm microphone business was still almost exclusively owned by uh, Neumann and AKG. There, there wasn't anything in the early 90s. And then the AT, the Audio-Technica uh, line came out with their early AT mics. But you know, even, even then, those mics were still $900 to $1,200 for a large diaphragm mic. And this is, you know, 90s, 90s dollars. So probably the equivalent of $1,200, $1,500 today. That's what, that's what you'd have to spend to, to get a large diaphragm mic. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's, so it wasn't until, uh, the early, I say about 92 or 93 that the Octava large diaphragm mics started to leak out of Russia and, or the Soviet Union at that time and be imported by, um, some British guys. Uh, and then they picked up a, a distributor in New York called, uh, Harris, Allied Harris, uh, and they were intended to be a mic that was going to be pitched as a, as a broadcast alternative, broadcast mic as an alternative to the U87. And that mic came on the market at $850, the equivalent of $850 now, wow. I think. Uh, I think it was $550 or $500, something like that. And, and I said, wow, this is a great deal. Now you can get a large diaphragm mic 
you know, speaking in today's dollars for $800 and I don't have to spend 1200 or 1500. So, uh, you know, I got one and then uh, started playing with that. And about at about the same time, when I was working for David, David showed up, uh, I worked for a sister company of his. He had he had already he and his partner had already sold um, uh, uh, DBX to um, the conglomerate uh, BSR. A lot of old people know them as uh, turntable manufacturers, but uh, they were a diversified company. And um, so David and his partner sold DBX, and they were still on contract to to run dbx but they had started another company uh, that made film sound equipment and that was the company that i was working for this is before earthworks or 93 94. but one day david brought in a a small bag of panasonic electret condenser capsules and he said okay we're going to have some fun with these things we're going to hack these things apart find out how they're made and make them better <laughs> so uh, that day, we, we hacked apart these, these little electric cap capsules, and, and those capsules became the very first Earthworks microphones. Wow. Uh, um, so that was, uh, so the first microphones I modified were, were Panasonic electric capsules that became Earthworks are, mics. You're talking about lavalier microphones, right? Yeah, these are the things that you see, you know, if you look, you know, with the Earthworks, uh, you know, the, the 30 series, you know, the long, it's like a measurement microphone. They're only a quarter of an inch in diameter. Oh, okay. And they're at the end of a long wand. And the, the whole point of that design is to keep the capsule away from uh, reflections, you know, so you don't, you don't want to have a, a whole reflection field around the transducer. And that was, that was, um, that was one of the things that I learned from David is uh, how to listen uh, um, when it comes to transducers, both uh, microphones on the front end and speakers on the on the back end. Um, so so two things were happening at the same time in the early 90s in my engineering life. Well, I had already worked doing um, for David for nearly 12 years at that point, doing compressors and expanders. Uh, noise reduction systems surround and this is all analog uh, analog noise reduction systems for um, motion picture sound and um, you know so he dumps these he dumps these capsules out we go to work on these electric capsules and at the same time the octava mics are becoming available and it wasn't more than a year or two that alice uh, uh allied harris dropped the line and that then they were picked up by guitar center and uh, were sold to Guitar Center, I think, for about $300. So now you could get into a, a, a large diaphragm condenser mic for about $300. And at that point, you know, you could buy one or two maybe and experiment on one and compare it with the first. And this, and is, I, this is like the mid-90s? Yeah, 90, uh, 93, I think. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so. that's, that's really cheap. I mean, Yeah, you know, it kind bucks. of gave... It gave me it gave me permission, you know, at that price point, you know, well, if you wreck it, if I wreck it, well, it's still a lot of money, but it's not the end of the world, you know, because you would not think about doing the things that I've done in mics uh, on, on a U87. Right. <laughs> You know, there's a couple of reasons. Well, one, they're expensive and two, um, you want you want to hold the resale value. And three, part of the sound of those microphones is tied up in the head basket design. So, you know, there are guys who work on Neumann microphones, um, you know, the most famously Klaus uh, Heine in, um, in Oregon and the late uh, Stephen Paul, who wrote, your, your, your audience might be really interested in this series that he wrote uh, for Mix Magazine back in the 80s about the history of the most popular Neumann microphones, it's uh, Stephen Paul. Are those um, online somewhere? Yeah, yeah. If you if you do a Google search for for Stephen Paul, and it's, it's spelled like Stephen Stephen Paul, uh, Stephen Paul Mix Magazine, you'll come up with this series of articles, and it's a fantastic series of uh, a, a look at the history of the U forty seven, U sixty seven, eighty seven, and the AKG C twelve. Nice. So so. You know, but those microphones are so highly prized that, I, you know, I would never think of attacking a U-47 to change the head basket to do something it's different. Like, it's like messing with a Leonardo da Vinci painting. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's already there. So, although my mentor David Blackmer, and this is a great story. He <laughs> he um, when he he um, he went to Harvard, and uh, after the war, after the Second World War, and he somehow had some kind of connection with the management at Boston Symphony Hall and was able to go in there and hang up his own personal U-47 that he had modified, that he had, I don't know what he, I don't remember the details of what he had did to this, done to this U-47, but he had modified it, a U-47, hung it up in Symphony Hall, and then had a high quality telephone line back to his um, uh, dorm room uh, on, uh, at the Harvard campus and back <laughs> over in Cambridge, uh, where he would, or he and a buddy would make transcriptions, you know, 16 inch <laughs> acetate transcription recordings on this, on this closed, closed system. What, just for fun? <laughs> yeah, just for fun. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't in the business of doing anything like that. It was just like a hack that he could do. But, you know, so David, <laughs> David would hack a Neumann, but I, the only Neumann, I will admit, the only Neumann I have hacked is, um, is a KM-184. You know, the, the KM-184 uses the same capsule as the legendary KM-84, which is, you know, made out of unobtainium, and it's it's a three thousand dollar, <laughs> three thousand dollar mic. Uh, but the capsule's the same, and all, all all that Neumann did to make a brighter sounding mic, you, you know, people were saying they kept they were responding to the marketplace. People wanted a brighter sounding small diaphragm pencil mic, so they they um, they closed down the venting area. On this, on the pencil microphone, and that um, that imparted um, a boost in the in the upper high frequency response around 9k. So they picked up a few dB of boost up there. So you can reverse engineer that. It's possible to take the mic apart. This is a 184. Take a 184 apart and then put it on a lathe or a milling machine and mill out those slots to enlarge the open area. So I've done that. And so you can kind of make a 184 sound somewhat more like a, a, an 84. Uh, the, the, the difference still remains that the, that the 84 has a transformer, that the, the 184 is transformerless. But you can, you can, you know, get a more antique or vintage sound out of a 184 by doing that. But I don't, I, I don't uh, advertise that. And uh, I don't make a big, uh, a lot of noise. In fact, that I have uh, Hacked a Bottom line is it sounds, at least in my opinion, because uh, I have one, like I said, I have one of your microphones. I'm using it right now. My go-to, I don't really like using it on vocals too much, but um, hi-hat, I use it all the time, and on acoustic guitar. I mean, th th those are the two things that I constantly make use of this microphone at. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of people have said, and I agree that it's, it's actually a bit more... Um, natural sounding than a 184. Uh, the, the, the noise floor in that six and that MXL 603 is a little bit higher than the 184. It's, it's not state of the art in that regard. And, you know, I had limitations based on the, the topology that I was presented with, you know, that that's the platform. That's what I've got to work with. Uh, so even, even parts upgrades you can't um, you get the, the self noise down to state of the art level, and and that's one of the reasons why I want to. I'm looking into doing, and am doing, my own branded small diaphragm mic because I want to have a mic that not only sounds great, but has a low self noise or, or a lower self noise mm -hmm. than that, that 603 class. You know, another thing I don't really like about it too much, but I still use it anyway because it's. I mean, it's not too bad, but um, it has a wider pickup pattern than. Uh, my other go-to for acoustic guitar is the SM81. Um, sure. On the hi-hat, you know, it just picks up a lot of snare bleed. Um, but like I said, I still use it because it sounds great. It doesn't, you know, I just like it. And also I'm out of microphones. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, that's, you know, that, that's an interesting, see, that's an interesting engineering conundrum. That is um, the balance between polar pattern, uh, you know, off-axis rejection and, on axis purity. So there's there's a there's a tension between those two design points because the the more that you work to a, the more that you make a mic be directional the less natural it's going to sound because to 
to achieve that, it's a phase cancellation. It's an, uh, elect, it's an acoustical phase cancellation network at play. Mm -hmm. um, and it not only um, rejects sound from the rear, but it has an impact on the front sound as well. So I have a tendency to go for mics that are a little bit more relaxed, have a little bit more relaxed cardioid pattern that tend to be a little bit closer to Omni than a really tight cardioid because the on-axis sound uh, is so much more natural if, if you let the pattern relax a little bit more towards uh, Omni. Yeah, like I said, I, I like it, and I, um, I like I said, it's my go-to for hi hat and acoustic guitar. And if I didn't like the way it sounded, I'd you know get rid of it and buy another eighty-one. You know. Yeah, that's um, that's how I feel about <clears throat> multi-pattern mics. Um, most of my work is a, a single pattern mic, and and if I and the way I figure, if you if you need a figure eight, well then you should get a. A, a figure eight ribbon microphone, a bi-directional ribbon mic, and get a figure eight pattern that way because multi-pattern mics uh, have some inherent compromises. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the switching is a compromise. Uh, using back-to-back uh, -back large diaphragm backplates to get a figure eight pattern. Uh, the null is not as perfect as a, as a, as a true figure eight uh, ribbon. Uh, the off-axis response has aberrations. So it, it's just another example of if I have like a design, some design guidelines, it's designing for, for uh, naturalness and shying away a bit from um, more complicated solutions that might have some sonic compromises. It, uh, I know it's not really along the same lines, but like I always tell people with, you know, like they take pictures with their cell phone cameras and they're like, well, how come my pictures don't look as good as yours? I'm like, well, number one, um, I'm using an 1800 hour still camera without a lens. It's 1800 bucks. Yeah. You know, if you want something that can take good pictures, buy a camera, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. don't use a f something that's <laughs> supposed to be used for making phone calls and expect it to look as good. I mean, you know, they're getting better, but there's only so much physics can do, you know? Yeah, you know, um, so some of that uh, plays out in the new, in my new K47H, you know, I describe it as a systems mic because that same small diaphragm body can be used with the Octava small diaphragm capsule, which is a wonderful sounding capsule. It sounds very similar to a Neumann KM84. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of, um, I, I'm not sure if it's that one, the, the 12, or there's there's one from Octava that a lot of independent filmmakers use for like a Sheps replacement. Yeah, it's the, they, there's a hypercardioid uh, capsule that, that goes on that body as well. So, I mean, you can, you can take that body, you can use a range of Octava capsules and my own large diaphragm capsule goes on there. So, so rather than have a, a microphone that's all of it is built into one housing with, with switching, uh, I'm kind of enamored of the approach that says, well, let's, let's optimize each capsule for what it does. And then when you need that polar pattern, put it on the head amp. So mm -hmm. when you need a large diaphragm capsule, put the K47H on the pencil mic body. When you need a small diaphragm on the, put that on. When you need a hypercardioid for, for a film or video shoot, put that on. So there's a very tight mechanical connection, excellent electrical connection. There's no switching, no mechanical switches. Um, so it's, it's a different approach. You know, the, the Shep's uh, Colette system is a... Is a uh, a microphone system, uh, multiple capsules. Yeah, the CMC, I think six, six something. Yeah, um, it's like the top of the line, you know, go to which I, I've never, I've never used. I've seen one, but, <laughs> um, but 